Welcome back to Introduction to Logic. This is Unit 2, Lecture 3, Part 1. In the previous videos, we learned about categorical propositions and how to make immediate inferences based on the logical relationships between them. We learned how to use the square of opposition to define the logical relationships between our four categorical propositions, the universal affirmative, the universal negative, the particular affirmative, and the particular negative. And we also learned how to use Venn diagrams to visualize each of those propositions. In the next three videos, we're going to learn how to build and evaluate more complex arguments using categorical propositions. In part one, we'll learn what a syllogism is, and then examine all of the parts that go into making a categorical syllogism. In part two, we are going to explore the figure and mood of categorical syllogisms. Finally, in part three, we'll learn how to use Venn diagrams to test categorical syllogisms for their validity. Let's get started with some definitions. We already know that every argument must contain at least one premise and at least one conclusion. So the simplest arguments may contain only two statements. A syllogism is a more complex argument containing exactly three propositions, two premises and one conclusion. Also, syllogisms are part of formal logic and therefore are always deductive. Now, if we were to build a syllogism using categorical propositions, we would have a categorical syllogism. It's important to note that since each categorical proposition has two distinct terms of which it's composed, a subject term and a predicate term, a categorical syllogism, which is composed of three different categorical propositions, will require us to have a total of three distinct terms. So we're going to be introducing a new term in this section. And it's these three distinct terms which will be the essential components of the inferential magic that makes a categorical syllogism valid, as we'll see below. Now it may seem counterintuitive, but we're going to begin our analysis with the conclusion of the argument instead of with the premises. The subject and predicate of the conclusion of a categorical syllogism gives us our first two new vocabulary terms. We define the major term as the predicate term of the conclusion. The subject of the conclusion is going to give us what we call the minor term. Now this may seem a little odd. Why isn't the subject of the conclusion the major term? Well, we're going to come back to that in just a minute. But first, let's consider the following argument as an example. Here we see we have two premises. For now, we'll just call them premise one and premise two. We're actually going to have names for them in a second. And we have one conclusion. Note that each statement in the argument is a categorical proposition. In this case, all three are universal affirmatives, that is, A propositions, but they wouldn't have to be. Now look at the conclusion. See how the subject of the conclusion, dogs, is being labeled the minor term, and the predicate of the conclusion, animals with hearts, is being labeled the major term. It is essential to learn that the subject of the conclusion is the minor term, and the predicate of the conclusion is the major term, because these terms are going to control the order of the premises in a categorical syllogism. So we always want to start with the conclusion, identify the subject and the predicate. The subject is the minor term, the predicate is the major term. Notice that the major term is located in premise 1, while the minor term is located in P2. The proposition that contains the major term will always be the first premise of the argument, while the premise containing the minor term is always going to be second. We're going to come back and put some labels on this in just a second. Okay, now that we've defined the major and minor terms, we can go on and think about the middle term. The middle term is the term found in the premises but not in the conclusion. Here we see that the term mammals appears in both of the premises, but not in the conclusion. This is really important. 
The middle term is like a bridge or a conduit that allows information from the premises to flow into the conclusion. As we'll see in the next video, the middle term can be in either the subject or predicate position of the premises, and indeed exactly how the middle term is oriented is going to have a direct impact on the validity of the argument. But for now, you just need to understand that the middle term is the one that appears in the premises, but not in the conclusion. Now that we've defined our three terms in the argument and noted that the major term is always found in the first premise of the argument and the minor term is always found in the second premise, we can define those two premises. The major premise of a categorical syllogism is the premise which contains the predicate of the conclusion, while the minor premise is the one that contains the subject of the conclusion. Remember that in formal logic, order is everything, so getting this vocabulary down is going to be absolutely essential to everything that we're going to do next. Now let's do a quick review of the vocabulary that we've covered in this first section. In this short video, we've learned that a categorical syllogism is a deductive argument composed of three categorical propositions. We've learned that every categorical syllogism has exactly three terms. The major term is the predicate of the conclusion. The minor term is said to be the subject of the conclusion, and the middle term is the one that's repeated in both premises but is not found in the conclusion. Further, we learned that the major premise, the one that comes first in the syllogism, must contain the major term. That's why it comes first, and that's why we call it the major premise, because it contains the major term. The minor premise, the one that comes second, is the one that contains the minor term, which of course is the subject of the conclusion. All of these parts are essential to understand as we move on to the next section. And in that next section, we're going to examine what happens when we build categorical syllogisms with different kinds of categorical propositions, as well as what happens when we change the placement or the orientation of the middle term in the premises of the argument. So, come on back next time, and let's learn some more about categorical syllogisms. See you then.